There we go. Good. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone out there in Facebook land. My name is Chief Master Sergeant Lewis Reyes, and I am your Exchange's Senior Enlisted Advisor. Let me tell you one thing. I don't know if you guys know how pumped I am today. I am so pumped. We have the man, the myth, the legend, but I won't say his name yet. I'm going to introduce my co-host first. Julie, Leah, how you ladies doing? Hi, it's good to see you again. Hi, good to see y'all. Doing good. Yes. Let's get this. Nobody wants to hear me talk. Let's get this going. Julie, you mind introducing our guest? Oh, you guys, we are so excited to have a comedic genius with us today. He's won Emmys and Grammys, and you know him best for his 16-year run on The Daily Show. But this funny man has a serious side, too. He's a fierce activist for our nation's military heroes and first responders. Please help me welcome the one and only John Stewart. <laughs> Hi, everybody. John, John, John. How are you? John, 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 That's the most enthusiasm I've had in five months. That's very nice. Thank you. <laughs> John, we are super excited to have you on. Thanks for taking time out to join us. And we hear you're coming to us uh, with no power. So we thank you for that. And everybody watching, no, no thank you as well. <laughs> Drop a note in the comments. Yeah, Let us that. know where it's, you're watching from. It, it may get, it may get a little funky because uh, you know we don't have we don't have power here in Jersey, uh, so uh, you know if it, if it gets a little funky, I apologize. No worries. Thanks so much for joining us anyway in the middle of all that. So everybody, um, let's get started with this. Now's a good time to start your watch party, and you can enjoy this live interview with your friends. Let's get, do you know what's, you know, what's awesome today? I've been watching John, let's get this going. I've been watching a few of your interviews and you've been up in the attic, mm -hmm. but today we get a fresh perspective. So you're in a totally It's, it's a fresh perspective. The attic has no power. So I, I, I can't sit up there in the attic. So I've, I've been allowed downstairs, which is uh, very unusual for me. Normally I'm kept up there with the, the guinea pig and the rabbit. So the fact that I'm down here with the dogs, well, it's a very special day. Very special. <laughs> this, this is awesome because we get a special treat, right? Everybody else gets the attic. We get the actual house. We got to meet uh, Scout and Dipper earlier. Maybe we'll introduce them here yep. in a little bit. Scout and Dipper. So <laughs> let, let's get this started. Uh, how, how you been during the pandemic? What's been going on? And where are you coming to us from today? Besides your, your kitchen or living room? Uh, I'm coming to you. I'm, I'm in New Jersey. We've, uh, we've dealt with the, the pandemic. As you know, it hit pretty hard here uh, a few months ago. Uh, but it's 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 leveled off a bit and because it leveled off uh god thought well, why don't i just throw a hurricane their way since they're <laughs> handling the pandemic uh just see if i can double down apparently he's not a, a fan of new jersey so uh <laughs> sent in some winds knocked so if you go out here the trees are just down uh everywhere and uh so everyone's everyone's using their chainsaws and and their masks it's really apocalyptic here in New Jersey right now. Hey, I would, I would, I would agree with you, John. I'm from Newark, New Jersey. I don't think, I don't okay. think uh, there's ever been a bright light going on in Jersey since I've been there. <laughs> Jersey's having a tough time, and all we're trying to do is keep things held down so that we can protect Springsteen. That's all. That's that's all anybody's <laughs> concerned about here. If we if we can keep things tight, protect Springsteen, things should work out. That is great. You're obviously you're known for your humor. And as you just proved just now with that, uh, that line. Um, so how do you find a bright, a bright side during hard times like pandemics and hurricanes? How do you stay so upbeat and positive? Well, I'm always, I'm always, you know, I, I take strength from uh, all the people that are working so hard during the pandemic to keep up the, you know, the essential workers and all. When I, when I see people, you know, heading out there, uh, strapping on uh, the lunchbox and 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 going out and doing the work, that that gives me hope, strength, optimism, all, all those things. So uh, if they can get out there and and do the things that they need to do in these difficult times, the least they can do is is sit them crack wise. So uh, you know I've been uh, hanging in there, even though I am really close. Told not to leave the bunker. I'm, I'm, I'm still out there. I'm still trying to do stuff. Um, I don't know if you can see the hair. It's getting a little gray. 
on there. <laughs> but it's, you know, it's, it's hard to keep that, that positive thing. But I think I, you know, seeing everybody else and how hard they're working during it, uh, that gives me the fight to keep going. Awesome. Excellent advice. And John, we know you love our military nation's military and first responders we have soldiers airmen sailors marines coasties and military families watching from all over the world do you have any words of thanks to share with all of our heroes continue to buy canned soup we really don't know how long this is going to last you guys get in the bunker eat your canned soup oh hey what the scout what are you doing this is scout hold on let me see if i can get scout is Scout very much wants uh, to be pet. So that's that's what this is about. All right, Hi, there Scout. we go. <laughs> I think I think we're boring her. No, I like the, I like the right. I like I the eye, like, the, the scout, like the, the patch. It's like an eye patch. It's pretty cool. You know what? She's it's like the uh, uh, the dog from Little Rascals. You remember Petey? The yeah, little yeah. rascals dog that had the like circle on his eye. Oh yep. now she she wants some okay. All right, that's okay. Oh. That's not. <laughs> All right, that's okay. That's fair. That's fair. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's um. I don't know if you know this, but my beard is made of liver treats. So, <laughs> dog is. Oh, and there's Smudge has just come in. Smudge, you want to say hello? This smudge. is Smudge. Hello, Smudge. That's Smudge. Can you see Smudge? Yeah. Hey, buddy. That's Smudge. Hello. And Dipper's How in the other How many dogs do you have, so. John? Okay. You have three dogs? Uh, we don't, we don't, we don't really, uh, we eat the food out. Whoever comes in to eat it, eats it. Uh, no, right now we've got uh, just these three guys, Dipper, Scout, and Smudge. And, uh, you know, we have goats and sheep and pigs, guinea oh, yeah, pigs, rabbits. I think there's children in there somewhere too, but I don't, I haven't seen them in a while. They're teenagers. No. By the way, if you want to see people panic, the pandemic, they couldn't care less. They're fine. When we lost Wi-Fi, you'd have thought it was over, man. You'd have thought it was. This was the big one. They were running around like the hair was on fire. I can't stream video. Help me. It kind of, yeah, it kind of sucks because you got to, first you're stuck at home due to COVID. And then the one thing, yes. your, your, your connection to the outside world is taken away. So then, you know, what do you do? Play Parcheesi, Monopoly? I mean, what <laughs> board games, I guess. Here's, here's what my family has learned uh, since we lost the Wi-Fi and, and during the pandemic. Um, they've learned that I'm not that interesting. You know, they, had, they don't have anything else to do except talk to me. But uh, turns out I'm really not that interesting. So, so what do you want, Smudge? You want to go out? No. Uh, Smudge is going to bark until I let her out. Hold on. I apologize for the chaos. It's, it's this is good. Chaotic. I like it. I like it. All right, guys. Go. Go, 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 go. Go, 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 go. All right. Dipper, you coming? You want to meet everybody? You can come. Hold on. Let's see if... Uh... <laughs> Let's see if we got this is like a here. live interactive feed, you know, that, with John Stewart. Come Aww. here, Dipper. There we go. That's Look at Dipper. Oh, Dip, hey, buddy. Dipper only has three legs, but he does a good job. All right. He's a good oh. boy. <laughs> so the point is, uh, we're all just trying to get by. Uh, but to your to your earlier question, um, all right, I'm letting the other one out now too. Okay, go on, go on, go on, come on, come on, Dips, let's go, come on. There you go. All right, go get him. All right, everybody's got to pee and poop. Fair enough. What were we talking about? <laughs> Let me go back here. Um, basically, do you have any words of inspiration to share with all our heroes out there on the front lines? Let me tell you something. I wish I had words of inspiration. You all inspire me. You know, uh, when, whenever I find myself uh, either on a USO tour or uh, just in doing some of the work we've been trying to do on, on burn pits, uh, I always walk away so much more fired up from my interactions 
uh, with our veterans and our active duty military. Uh, you know, and they'll, you know, I, I can remember uh, we went to Afghanistan and we're doing a USO tour and we were in uh, Kandahar. And uh, these guys would come out of the, you know, wherever they were, the, this crazy terrain. It looked like they were fighting a war on the surface of Mars. And they would come off, you know, a 24 hour ship do, doing something. And, and they would thank me for, for coming to see them. And I always felt like such a fraud because the truth is, you know, all we can do is thank them as best we can. And, and that was the whole reason of even uh, going. Uh, but they're always so appreciative of, of everything that's uh, done on their behalf. And yet we don't do nearly enough on their behalf. You know, unfortunately, such a small percentage of the country serves uh, and Americans have a tendency to kind of not see what's not right in front of their face. So uh, my goal is always to just put them front and center so that people can uh, see just the incredible quality of the individuals that we have uh, serving and who have served and now uh, working to make sure that, you know, if we've got enough money for war, we've got enough money to take care of everybody when they come home, you know, for, for the conditions that unfortunately occur in the prosecution of war. So that's, that's kind of what we're working on now. I think those are, I think those are great initiatives and it, it kind of leads into my follow-up question. What, what drove you to become so passionate about service members and their families? And do, do you have a connection to the military? Hello? Hello? I, I got booted. Hey, sorry about that. I, I you're think sideways. The, the I think you're sideways, me. though. I am? Okay. How about now? Better? Yes. Yep, yeah, we got you. Sorry. Okay. Yeah, the thing, it, it, it got booted. I'm, I apologize again. The power is out, so everything is super spotty here. There we go. Okay. Sorry about that, guys. We back? We back. We're right. You want me to, did you hear the question? You probably missed the question. Oh, I'm sorry. I missed it. I got, I got booted. All right, all right. Uh, I just, uh, the question was, what drove you to become so passionate about service members and their families? And do you have uh, a connection to the military? Uh, my father served. Uh, he, he was at, uh, during the Korean War. Uh, and he was stationed at uh, Fort Bliss. Um, and so you can imagine a kid from Brooklyn. My mom was from Washington Heights. Uh, and the first time they'd ever really been out of the city. I mean, neither one of them even drove. Uh, they found themselves in, you know, El Paso, Texas, uh, 110 wow. degrees. So they, they were like in a, a different world. But uh, for me, the the real story started after the Iraq war. You know, I had a show where I was, you know, talking a lot about my feelings about it. But I thought I hadn't, if I really wanted to know what it was, I had to go talk to the people that were actually uh, downrange and doing it. So I used to start going to Walter Reed and Bethesda and talk to, uh, you know, you do these kind of walking tours where you go in and you, you meet some uh, men and women who've unfortunately uh, been injured. Uh, and those experiences were so transformative because as I said, I think the military is somewhat isolated from the general populace. So having the experience to go and, and meet with them and talk to them and just see the incredible dedication they have, the tenacity, the love they have for each other. Um, the, the, the thought, you, know, you see people, they just lost a limb and, and taking their time to make sure I was comfortable. You know, um, just an incredible spirit. Uh, and so that developed into a long relationship with uh, the USO. And uh, then through our work with the first responders in New York, uh, we started to get involved in, in, again, the issues of burn pits in Afghanistan and Iraq, and also just the, the, the exposures that service members face wherever they are, K2 or Uzbekistan and, you know, all those areas where when they come back, they've suddenly got to prove to uh, a med board or to the VA that, uh, you know, this crazy 
pulmonary issue they're having or the breathing problem or the kidney cancer is related to the fact that they slept next to an open pit burning jet fuel. So we're trying to work towards flipping the presumption so that the soldier and his family and his caregivers aren't the ones on their own advocating and having to prove their case. We want to flip it so that you've got to prove that it wasn't and that we have a presumption for people that serve. And, and, you know, look, to be honest with you, when people talk about it, it's always about the money. You know, they always say, oh, geez, that's going to be a lot of money. Well, you had money to send them there. You better have money to take care of people when, when they get home. And if money's a problem, I think, listen, Raytheon, McDonald, Douglas, all these companies, they make a pretty nice piece of change off of our nation's military. I'd love for them in the way that oil companies have like a 10% contingency, let those war profiteers take 10% and put it away every time we go to war so that when our guys and men come home, that fund is there to make sure that they get the disability and the health care that's coming to them so that their families aren't struggling. So it's, you know, I, I got to tell you, I think it's a simple solution. It's just trying to get the political will. Uh, to make sure that this gets done. The fact that, you know, we still have Vietnam veterans fighting claims for Agent Orange from the 60s. That's uh, unconscionable. It shouldn't be happening. And, you know, whether it's Gulf War syndrome or Agent Orange, uh, toxic exposures, uh, burn pits, we have to stop pretending like these things have not caused a tremendous amount of uh, uh damage to our men and women. So that's what, that, that, that's what we're fighting for now. You're clearly very passionate about service members, first responders, veterans, and, and our heroes. And you've supported and attended Warrior Games for the last couple of years. And you filmed mm -hmm. that opening ceremony video last year. How did you become involved with Warrior Games? And what was that experience like meeting our wounded warriors? Uh, well, so we had... Uh, what we started doing is we started seeing, so after doing the Walter Reed stuff and meeting people, uh, I was approached by a guy uh, from uh, American Corporate Partners, a guy named Sid Goodfriend. So we started an internship at the show. It was like an immersion program for veterans. So you would get veterans who were interested in a career in television or film, and they would come on. We'd do like 24 vets at a time per semester. And we kind of, uh, they'd immerse themselves in the show for a week and then they'd come back and they'd meet with uh, different uh, segments of the show. So they'd meet with the writers, they'd meet with production, they'd meet with studio, um, and they'd learn about the business. And then we'd do like a career fair at the end of it. So it's been a really nice program. And it's actually, you know, I'll go and I'll do a show somewhere. Somebody come up and be like, hey man, I was, uh, you know, internship class three. And, uh, you know, a lot of people have, have gotten hired on it. And Sid told me about this Warrior Games. He said, would you go up and host it? This was uh, five or six years ago. Army was, the, it rotates. And it's for wounded warriors. They use adaptive sports to get back that, you know, oftentimes in the military, these guys are incredibly competitive. They're incredibly driven. You know, the thing that defines them is their high level of achievement. So when they are wounded or sick, you know, that can feel lost and transitioning, you know, that's isolating to begin with. And then you're transitioned out of your unit. So you don't have that camaraderie anymore. So Warrior Games was a great way for them to reconnect with that, that warrior part of their soul. These men and women that, you know, may be uh, feeling a little bit down, a little bit isolated, and they rejoin their, they form a new unit, you know? Uh, and, and that's, that's really exciting for them. Uh, and it, and it saves lives. I'm, I'm sure it saves lives. So this is about five years ago, six years ago. Uh, I'm an old man. So my memory is not the best. <laughs> so I went up to West Point and I was so blown away by, uh, there was a, uh, just the people that refused to allow themselves to be defined by the worst thing that ever happened to them. They define themselves by their reaction to that, their resilience in the face of that, the, the challenge of overcoming that. And I'm watching these athletes perform 
And it's just the athletes, some of their family members and the caregivers. And there was a gentleman, uh, Matt Lammers, who triple amputee, both legs, one arm, who had really been in a dark place, you know, uh, and felt lost and had lost a lot of his brothers and sisters. And, you know, really, mm -hmm. and he found swimming. And so he went into the pool in the swimming competition and he didn't win, but as he was rounding the bend for that final lap, the whole arena stood, I mean, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marines, SOCOM, like everybody up and bringing him home. And it was such a beautiful uh, and inspiring moment. And I, I, so I'm driving home and I brought my son there because I want him to be around better people than me. So I, I bring him to these things. And on the way home, I was saying, you know, this is outrageous that it's just isolated at West Point. ESPN should be here. And, uh, and he said, oh, why don't you call them? So we, we did. And they showed up and they filmed some ESPN pieces for it. And then they got involved in it. And the next year they sent, so then we did it I think it was in Chicago. It, it started to get bigger. We had the opening ceremonies at Soldier Field. We had ESPN there doing a live sports center when they did wheelchair basketball. Like these guys are, you know, men and women are incredible athletes and competitors. Uh, and so ever since that one at West Point, I've hosted it ever since. The last one we did was in Tampa. We're supposed to do it this year in San Antonio. Uh, and unfortunately, because of COVID, it got canceled. But we're hoping. Uh, you know, we're hoping next year. So we've actually been talking to each team individually just to make sure we all stay connected during this time because that's the most important thing. Wow. Hey, great, great words. Thank you so, so much, John. I'm going through the Facebook uh, live feed right now and lots of love, people from all over the world. Kelly Anguiano says, thanks for being an amazing advocate for the military and first responders, watching from Ramstein Air Base, Germany. There's another, yeah. Uh, yeah, there's people, somebody wrote Springsteen, go Bruce. <laughs> that was Scott Lohman. You get a lot of that. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Chris yeah, Cohen yeah. watching, a lot of people watching from all over the world. Jennifer McDermott says, John, my sister-in-law is one of Ray Pfeiffer's nieces. My father is also oh. a 9-11 first responder. I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you for all of the work you have done on behalf of them. The thank you isn't enough, but man, you are so appreciated. God bless. Uh -huh. So That's so kind of you. Ray Pfeiffer was Ray Pfeiffer was one of the so the 9-11 bill is now named in part after Ray Pfeiffer. Uh, Jimmy Zadroga, Ray Pfeiffer, and, and Louis Alvarez. It's the it's the Pfeiffer Zadroga Alvarez act now. But Ray Pfeiffer was an incredible guy. He really was so critical in getting that legislation passed in 2015. Without Ray Pfeiffer. He had stage four cancer at that time. He was, he was down there on like a, a motorized wheelchair. He couldn't even walk at that point. Still advocating like a champ for uh, all his brothers and sisters. So Ray Pfeiffer, just a, gr a great, great man. Yeah. We shout, out, shout out to Ray Pfeiffer, right? Well, shout out yep. to him. Thank you. And his family, of course. So with that, right? Um, I want to do something a little bit different. You probably see some other sure. people on the screen. And of course, when you go to most installations, you know, a lot of the senior leaders hang out with the celebrities, but I wanted to do something different. So I brought some of your fans on here to ask you questions. Yeah. So first up, I got Benjam Benjamin and Dino out of Cincinnati, Ohio. He's retired, a career Intel specialist and retired. Uh, Benjamin, floor is yours, man. Hey, John, uh, man, thank you so much hey, Benjamin. For, for being here. Uh, it, it's a complete honor to talk to you. Uh, thanks for taking time, uh, especially when you have no power right now. Hopefully, you know, you weather the storm up there and get your power back soon. We're going to go cannibal. <laughs> Give me another six hours. Things, things are going to go Lord of the Flies here. It's going to get crazy. Well, if you can mobilize ESPN that quick, I'm sure you can mobilize somebody, bring you some generators and get your Wi-Fi back up for your kids. You know? <laughs> but, there we go. There we go. 
But, uh, uh, you know, honestly, you know, thank you for uh, taking your time to talk to us. Um, you know, as a 23-year vet, someone that's been to Afghanistan, K2, Iraq, you know, I appreciate everything you're doing for the burn pit victims um, and, and all that stuff and, and what you did. I love your passion for what you do. I've seen a lot of your speeches on Capitol Hill for the 9-11 um, Compensation Fund, and it just, it just hits home. Man. I, I've always loved how you were able to bring honesty and truth on your show and everything you do to make the even most complex issues that seem so simple. And I wish more people would listen to you and take your advice. <laughs> <laughs> I got three in the house right now that don't. Yeah, I got three in my house that don't either. I understand. Yeah. But uh, yeah. <laughs> so I want to personally thank you for that. And you know, you're very kind for saying so. Thank you. Yeah. And everything that you've done with the 9-11 Compensation Fund and now with the burn pit, do you think you're starting to develop a slight fetish for helping people with respiratory issues or is it just... <laughs> <laughs> As someone who's pretty out of shape, I figure if I can help people, you know, in, in the same condition, um, you know, it really is, honestly, it developed from that idea of if we don't take care of the people who take care of us, and who are we? What good are we? And I think that it's, it, it's, it's just stems from that feeling of being angered by watching people, you know, you're a gentleman, 23 years of your life given to service, you know, for others. And, and the idea that when you would come home, making sure that you and your family are okay isn't our biggest priority is, is what we're talking about here. And it's too easy for the bureaucracy of DOD and VA to, you know, pass the buck to both sides in a computer system that don't talk to each other. But it really stems from trying to honor your commitment and your sacrifice, because that's really what drives everybody that's advocating is the sense of wanting to live up to the standard that people like yourself have set. You know, that that's and when, you know, you talked earlier, you said, well, how do you keep upbeat during, you know, pandemic and all that? It's because of that. It's because of witnessing people sacrifice in the face of, you know, all kinds of hardship for others. You know, that's the ethos that I see so much in the first responder community and in the, the military community. So that's it's it's a tribute to the quality of you guys you know, really more than anything else. Thank you for using your platform for us, John. It really means a lot. Much so appreciated, up, my friend. Next up, I have, they'll have some time for some second questions too, a little bit later on. We'll see how much time we sure, have. Sure, sure. We got, we got uh, Basilio Morales out of Hickam Air Force Base, Hawaii. Aloha. Floor is oh. yours, Morales. Make sure you unmute yourself. Hawaii. Aloha, John. <laughs> Yeah, I'm one of the lucky guys got stationed, took one for the team yeah. and got stationed in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. <laughs> the other fellow's oh. out there on K2. The other fellow's out there in Uzbekistan. You got yourself, you're, you're hanging 10, my baby. Hey, I, I used to guard nukes in North Dakota for four years, five All months, right. 15 days, eight All hours, right. you 37 paid your dues. minutes, 43 seconds. Paid, you paid your dues. You paid your dues. So, <laughs> we'll, we'll accept Hawaii. We'll accept it. <laughs> Um, but, uh, John, you know, I, I really, I really am a big fan of yours. Um, and Thank you, sir. The very first thing I want to do is aloha from me to aloha. you. Um, Thank you. And before my, before I actually ask this question, I, I have to say that comedy and satire and, and comic books have all been a huge part of my life. I'm a fellow kid from Brooklyn and life hey. is very strange in the apple and uh, very strange in the zoo. And uh, you're yeah. the 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 way that you were able to portray like a true perspective from your comedic vision helped me mentally and uh, emotionally wow. to deal with like the absurdity I see from time to time. Right. Um, to where I gotta I gotta not take it very serious, but I gotta say what I gotta say. And um, yep. as a person who's been serving for almost twenty three years now, um, I am very. I'm very proud to see citizens like you stand up and do the thing you do and give mm. back. It, it, it makes it an honor for me to serve and protect you. 
Um, just wow. as it is for the rest of the teammates that we have. Um, you're the reason why we have liberty in the first place. And, and nothing explains that more than your statement after on the 9-11 show or the Daily Show, where you took the, it was sad to see the towers go, right? And you were, you said that from your home you used to see the towers and, uh, but now you see the Statue of Liberty and it's beautiful. And that, that meant a lot yeah. to me. Um, it meant that. No, oh, thank you, Basilio. People out there, you know, can can empathize with the fact that we haven't lost our way of life, no matter what adversity comes our way. So I want to thank you for mm -hmm. that and all your work that you're doing right. with with veterans and stuff. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, it can't my, be taken my, away from us, Basilio, because you know it's we're the only ones that can do that to ourselves. But uh, you know, it's it's people like you that are out there on the front line, that's that's so important. Thank you for that. Thank you, really. Um, and, and my question for you is more about your creativity. Um, I, I really want to know, mm -hmm. um, as, a, as a person who really doesn't know what he wants to do when he grows up, I don't know how, what I want to do when I grow up. <laughs> and yeah. how one someone, you have a lot of experience in your life to get to where you are. Um, how would somebody from mm -hmm. my 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 current point in life strive to be able to mm -hmm. create something as amazing as you have? Because um, I just saw Irresistible, and it's it's I it's it's one of those you got to be like a very intellectual, but it's also a great flick. It's a great movie. It's a popcorn movie for oh, me. Thank you. Um, and I, I it was you. it was a pleasure to watch it. I would like to know how do I get to that point in my life, you know, um, using the well. Thank you for, for saying that. Um, you know, the thing I would say is, you know, and and we ran into this. It's funny in, in the internship program, is don't discount how unique and special your skill set is. You know, as someone that's put in almost 23 years in the military. So, you know, we used to have the, the, the interns, ex-military veterans, and they were all really nervous about their experience and the fact that, like, you know, they had never worked in television and could they do it? And I always used to say to them, I don't know if you guys can handle television. Pretty high pressure. You know, if you, if you screw up in the television business, the show's not going to be that good. And they would all be like, oh, right. I've faced down, you know, war plan. I've, you know, I've been down range. Like all, all the things that you've accomplished in your life, you always have a tendency to discount them as being special. So the thing I always make sure that I remind our veterans is think of how what you've accomplished in that time as a member of a team, as someone who can work tirelessly under pressure towards a goal, like the skill set that you've developed in those 23 years is what will serve you in whatever uh, field or endeavor you want to enter into. Because the ability to, in comedy, in life, the ability to collaborate, the ability to work together, the ability to invest yourself in a larger goal without just taking ownership over all of it. Those are qualities that make good everything. Art, science, commerce, people who know how to work towards a, a, a goal, make the world go round. You're one of those people. So the, 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 the real piece of advice I would give you is don't forget who you are to this point. You're not starting new. You've developed all these incredible skills and talents. You've developed a worldview. You've lived a life. Nothing's more important in art than living a life. And you've done that. To go from Brooklyn to Hawaii, man, that's a story in itself. Like, that's a beautiful uh, uh, juxtaposition that you could mine for all kinds of interesting stuff. Kid from the streets of Brooklyn, Aloha, and in, in now he's in Hawaii. You know, so 
It's about looking at your personal experiences and translating them, but also giving yourself credit for the work experiences that you've had. It is translatable. The time you put into the military is not a uh, time that took you away from this other goal. It's time that helped build skills that can propel you to that goal. D -d does that make sense, Basilio? Oh yeah, absolutely does. Wow, great, great, absolutely. great answer, right? And, 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 and value that, ex value that experience because it's, you know, the, the people that we hired from our internship were a dream for us. People that had experienced things that, you know, uh, uh, were unusual, that were resilient, that were tenacious. Like it, it's, it's invaluable what you've experienced. So I guess you heard it there first, but see, don't sell yourself short. You Better not. Hey, value, just to give from Brooklyn is what Captain America says, man. <laughs> there you go, baby. Hey. A Street, A Street and Avenue O, represent. <laughs> Red Hood, baby. Hey, Next up, next up, next up, I have Tim Macklin coming out of Virginia Beach, 12 years into service, right, Tim? I think he's a, he is a stand-up nice. comedian. He practices stand-up comedy. So, Tim, floor wow. is yours, brother. Hey, how's it going, John? Where is Tim? It's going Can great. Now, I can't see you. How, how, you got to scroll. How do I do that? On the top, put okay, it on gallery okay. view. Or, or scroll. Wait, I got it. I got it. I got it. Boom. What's up, man? Hey, how's it going, John? I just wanted to say, um, uh, first of all, I just uh, watched your movie and it, it was really good. It was hilarious, but made a lot of good points. And uh, the uh, the Hispanics Thanks, scene, the speech after that was, uh, I, it was amazing. It was it was really good. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. That's Corel. Corel genius. That's, that's awesome. That's awesome. Uh, I also want to say- Thank um, you. You had a you had a really big impact uh, in my life growing up. I had a I had a pretty tough childhood, but having having you on the Daily Show to look forward to every night really helped. And uh, you know, like thank my, you. My dad, yeah, no, oh, thank you. My dad was on drugs, but I had the moment of Zen, so you know it like balanced out. Uh, no, it's it's I'd I'd say I'd call it even. That's that's about yeah. even, right? <laughs> yeah, it's a wash. It's it's good. It's a wash. <laughs> <laughs> and look at you now, doing stand-up yeah. comedy, living in Virginia Beach. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, uh, I mean, I was doing stand-up comedy until like four months ago, but it's... Oh, right. It's Nobody's tough, doing it now. No, no. It's tough. It's, uh, turns my out, question turns out audiences are very, very important to stand-up comedy. Right? <laughs> I have friends doing Zoom shows and stuff, but it's just not, it's not the same as just filling the room and stuff. It's, it's tough. A buddy of mine did a show... He did a drive-in. Everybody sat in their cars. And yeah. he said it was the weirdest. <laughs> it, it was doing comedy in front of a traffic jam. Like it was the <laughs> he said it was the weirdest experience. You heard nothing. And then at the end, like people beeped. And you're like, oh, oh I don't know. So, so yeah. you could just be bombing the whole time. Just oh, that's rough. That's rough. rough. Rough, but hopefully I figured they they, they honk their horns for laughs. Yeah, that's what it was. They honked their horns, but like we're all you know, you're trained like in New York. Somebody honks their horn, you give them a finger. So like <laughs> as soon as they honk their horn, they're like, oh, we're laughing. You're like, you got a problem, man? You look at me. You want, you want me to come over there? <laughs> oh, that's awesome. Uh, I my question is, so I know you had a lot of experience with this on the Daily Show. Uh, but right now with everything going on, how do you, how do you write a joke when everything around you is not funny and everything seems bad? Right. You know, that's, ain't that the trick, but <laughs> you know, here's the thing. When you were a kid growing up and you had no control over anything and your pop wasn't there for you, what'd you find? humor you found some somewhere inside of you a way to cope with the difficulties and the tragedies and that's you know it's a particular brain that does that uh yours is one of them and i would just say don't run away from the bad because that's 
really the fuel for your coping mechanism, for your comedy. Mm -hmm. You know, think about how you did that when you were a kid and kind of get back in touch with that. You know, that's, that's what I try and do in all this is, you know, I remember uh, the way I dealt with bad things that were happening and, and you try and you almost embrace the absurdity of it. And, and you don't run away from it. You don't need to pretend it's not happening. Just like you didn't pretend it wasn't happening when, when you were a kid, but you found ways to soothe yourself and understand that like, if you can soothe yourself, you can soothe other people. You can, you can make other people feel better using that, that same thing. So I would say in a weird way, embrace it. Don't run away. You know, don't, don't, Try and pretend like you're not feeling like you're feeling, but find a way to cheer yourself up and you'll find a way to, to, to get it to other people, I think. Awesome. Thanks, John. I really appreciate that. No, thank you, man. And have a lot of fun with it. Enjoy yourself. Thank you. Outst I appreciate it. Outstanding. Right, we have one more. Ray Alvarez out of Newark, New Jersey, probably the youngest in the bunch at 18 years of age. Ray. Director 19. Newark. 19. 19. There you go. Actually, Louis uh, Louis Reyes nice. here is my brother, so he invited <laughs> me to the show. It was a funny story. He texted me out of nowhere. He's like, "You know John Stewart?" And I was like, "Yeah, I, why wouldn't I?" And then he goes, "Well, I'm gonna have him on the show." And I was like, "Really? You're getting to me?" I was like freaking out. And he's like, "You want to join?" And I I took it right right at the right when I heard it because when I was younger, first of all, I want to say this is an honor because when I was younger um, in middle oh. school, when I had a bedtime, I couldn't watch your shows when they went on at, I think it was like 1030 or 1130. I had to watch them yeah, at 11 o'clock yeah. and 730. Well, with like you and Nicole Bear, where I had to watch both of them. And that was also when I started the, oh, uh, to join the debate team. And so I would watch them the day after. And it was kind of the time where I started opening up my mind to politics and, and to kind of that whole world in general. But the thing that always stood out to me was how you brought people together at the end of it, no matter what, even if your jokes hit on a certain topic, you were able to make people laugh and come together. Right. And I remember your last show when Bruce Springsteen came on, that was actually my introduction to yeah. Bruce Springsteen. Um, and Land of Hopes oh. and Dreams was actually my, one of my favorite songs by him uh, along, by, alongside Best. Spirits of the Night. Um, so kind of my question comes down to how do you use the mediums in which you've inhabited, for instance, film, TV, um, or just even your mm -hmm. advocacy work, how do you use them as a means to also bring people together to either increase activism or just to introduce people to others who they haven't heard their perspectives? Right, um, that's a great question. Um, before I answer, my first question to you is, uh, in Newark, do you guys have power? Yeah, we do, do you have I didn't lose power. Okay, I'm, I'm coming over to your house. Um, I would, hey, I, I would love you. I, I would love to have you for dinner. Very nice of you. I just, I, I won't stay long. I just got to put some stuff in your fridge. You got egg salad. <laughs> I got some other things around here. It's all going bad. It's not, things it's are not right. good right now with that. I'll clear a whole shelf for you. Here's, 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 here's what I would say about about that. When, when, you believe in what you're doing. You know. You start out with the premise of you believe in what you if you believe it it's going to have authenticity and if it has authenticity people can relate to it if if you know we're all way more universal than we like to believe uh different political persuasions different races different religions but there's a universality there that we always get pulled away from by the powers that be it's not convenient for uh political power or for others, they like to pit everybody against each other. And that's not to suggest there aren't real differences and, and, and different things, but if you go with how you really believe, the authenticity of that will resonate with people. And when you do something that resonates with people, it naturally gets them in touch with those universal feelings that we all share, that commonality. And that's, I think, you know, you talked about it in the way of it was my introduction into something and you moved into debate. Well, debate works best when you really believe, when you're honestly sharing, but also honestly listening. And listen, and, and 
that's not to say that you might not at the end of the debate go, this person is an idiot, but at least you heard them out. Do you know what I mean? And at least you brought an honest attempt to share your perspective on it. Because that's all, you know, ultimately all we can do is share our honest beliefs and authenticity with other people through a film, through stand up, through debate, through just interaction. You know, life ain't Twitter. Life isn't 140 characters of saying the worst thing you can possibly think of to say to somebody on the internet. It's about being in front of each other, being together and working towards improving the human condition, not defining it and separating it. Um, and that's, that's I, I think, and I also, I, I try and when I'm working, I try and really get to how I feel about something with the understanding that once I put it out there, it's not mine anymore. And everyone, all you can control is your intention. What did you want to say? Some people may hear what you want to say and have a completely different uh, representation of what that is. And you can say to them, that's not what I meant, but all you can, can do is, is control that part of it. Don't worry about what they might think. Worry about your best way of communicating what you authentically feel. That to me, that's the best work. That's the best art. That's the best life. Thank you, John. And electricity also helps. Oh, and electricity. Electricity yeah. helps. Let me let me let me rewind that. Authenticity and electricity. Oh, Is there you really, go. A and E right there. Because otherwise, the food. I got to tell you, the smell in my house right now. <laughs> the dogs. Let me tell you something. The spoilage of our food is letting the dogs off the hook because Lord knows they don't smell so good either. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, John. No, thank you. John, it's been five years since you left the daily show. Any thoughts on doing a show like this again? Um, you know, I think sometimes I, you know, it was, it was the right time for me to leave. You know, I started making decisions based on whether or not I was going to have to change into a suit. You know, they'd come up with a, a sketch and I'd be like, oh, wait, does that mean I have to wear a suit and do it around noon? I have an idea. Why don't we just wait for rehearsal? Um, so I, I'd taken about as far as I can take it. Um, I do think about other other shows, other formats. and things. I don't think I'll ever do a, a daily one again, uh, but I'd like to do some maybe longer form uh, more considered specials, things like that. Maybe try and use the things I learned doing the daily show with the things I've learned since then and, and see what we can see what we can come up with. So John, I, I know some of our guests mentioned your new movie and my family and I, we love going to the movies and we are, we had planned to actually go see Irresistible in the theaters. We had seen the trailers for it. Now we're, uh, we're fixing to, nice. we're we're all good. We're going to watch it here at home this weekend. There you um, go. So That's what nice. was it? <laughs> Thank you. What was it like releasing a movie during a pandemic, especially when that should have been on the big screen and not the small screen? Uh, it's like showing up to a plane crash with a chocolate bar. Like it's this <laughs> terrible tragedy unfolding and, you know, people are, are hurting and out of work and sick. And then I'm just like, who wants to see a movie? Like it's just a, a dopey, a, a dopey thing to do. But um, you know, I, I think people's minds are so occupied by so many real things uh, that maybe something like this can kind of help uh, as a, a bit of a distraction. And you know, we're all sort of tired of watching the same stuff all the time. Uh, but it's, you know, even for me, it's it's certainly not where my thoughts are right now is in, in New Jersey here, we got hit pretty hard and everybody went through a really tough time. Uh, and there's a resilient place. I mean, we've been through Sandy and, and all that, but you know, the mood is, is tough. It's, it's tense. People are really nervous about their health, but also their livelihoods. You know, it's balancing out 
how we're going to get through this. You know, I, I think it's, it's so important that we feel connected and led responsibly. And uh, so hopefully that'll happen. Good. And John, so many of us are fans of yours and we got to know you from watching you on TV. So tell us what is your must see TV? It was ESPN until <laughs> all the leagues stopped. Um, well, you know, it, it's here's the thing, and I'm going to tell you this. This goes. This is just between us. Just between us, chickens. <laughs> okay. Okay. Bachelor in Paradise. <laughs> My wife got me into it, and I started out making pretty good fun of it. And then about halfway through it, I was like, why can't Demi find love? What's going on? Why? She's so sweet. Why is, why is uh, Trevor doing this to her? Uh, You know, I I like the trashy stuff, you know. Uh, I generally don't invest in like big narrative things because I don't have the attention span for it. Uh, But we like to watch that. she did try and get me to watch Dancing with the Stars, and I felt like that was a just a bridge too far. Uh, <laughs> now, Dancing with the Stars in Paradise. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Really, I just like seeing who's, who's hooking up with who. That's really all I care about. That's the show I want to see. <laughs> Isn't that why just everybody Just young, attractive same. people. I just, I love the idea that, that they would meet a guy that would fall in love and then like he would leave the show and they'd be like, I'll never be whole again. And then like some other dude walks in and like, hello, handsome. Like it just flipped, you know? So yeah, that's that's mostly. Other than that, not a whole lot going, not a whole lot going on around here. <laughs> hey, hey, John, we got a couple more questions, but I'm gonna pass it around one more sure. time to our guests. So Ray, mm-hmm. what kind of question do you have for John? So, um, as I spoke before, your, your uh, show helped me get politically minded, but I think that's also something that you can attribute to my generation, Gen Z and millennials as well, as they mm-hmm. are a very vocal group and they're very, very pu- like uh, pushy towards the things that they want. So I was sure. just wondering, what are your thoughts on this kind of political resurgence within these younger generations? And if you have any words of, of guidance for them in order to maybe help them in their in the long term so they don't kind of burn themselves out and hate the political system at the end of it. Uh, you have the ability to transform it. Don't accept the status quo. Don't accept the way things are because that's the way they, you know, as you see when we go down there, we, we, we look to our elected officials to do what you would think would be the least controversial thing in the world, take care of our first responders and our military. When they come home and they're with wounds, invisible and otherwise, or sicknesses. Um, don't accept uh, things as they are just because they are, you know, John Kennedy had that great quote of, uh, you know, some people, uh, see things as they are and ask why, and others see things as they could be and ask why not. And I think, I think always, always ask yourself, why not? You know, it just takes, it, it takes the action. What I love about your generation is their enthusiasm, their idealism, but also they are very, you know, people always talk about it like, ah, oh, young people are so self-centered. I, I don't see that. I see uh, your generation as more aware of the world and the largeness of it than, than certainly mine was. Um, so I, I would say as, as long as you can retain that feeling that you can change it. Don't, don't, don't let it get beaten down. Look at, I mean, don't, 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 I'm only 28. Look what it's done to me. So stay with it. Thank you, John. Thank you. Hey, awesome, awesome. A great question, great answer, John. Benjamin, what you got? Yeah, John, uh, you know, you talked a couple minutes ago talking about how you don't think you'd do another daily show, but maybe something a little bit more long form. I hope that doesn't mean you're going to try and take uh, last week tonight away from John Oliver because, you know, that's my... I would never do that. (laughs) I would never spark... 
it, it would spark another war between America and the United Kingdom. I couldn't do it. Uh, it, it would be akin to throwing tea into a harbor. Uh, John Oliver is a, he's a treasure. Um, and if I may say so, dimples as wide as the Thames, just a beautiful, beautiful man. A little pasty, I'm not gonna lie to you. Uh, yeah. And the chest is somewhat concave, not a healthy guy. No, no, but, beautiful. Uh, but my, my other question for you is, you know, one of the things I admired about you uh, growing up watching you is the fact that you've always been able to hold people's feet to the fire when you're, when you're interviewing them or when you're in front of Congress, like I mentioned earlier. Um, and I went back this morning and I watched your Crossfire interview from 2006, which is one of my favorite moments with you. And you made a comment on there that they're doing a disservice to the nation by not holding politicians' feet to the fire. Do you still think that the media is not holding politicians accountable the way they should be? And do you stand by what you call Tucker Carlson on the show? <laughs> uh, you know, so here first, the media. Um, I, I view them with such uh, reverence that to see them fall into that sort of kabuki theater, that kind of kayfabe and, uh, you know, from the right, from the left, you know, all that dishonest commentary is really hard because I think they serve as our country's immune system to a large extent. Um, and I think that by you know, a lot of what the movie is about is about this political industrial media complex where they're all kind of in this bubble enriching themselves and each other, but not doing the service that they need to be doing for the people who rely on them. You know, people are busy, people have lives, people have responsibilities. And the media serves, and that, by the way, not to say that there aren't tremendously talented and passionate and wonderful people that work within it, but the system that's been set up that creates it as gladi gladiatorial entertainment does an enormous disservice to, and, and you see it now, and look, the internet just amplifies it. You know, when you have things like Facebook, and I know we're on it right now, but Facebook is a, a, a perpetual radicalization machine. If you watch this video, they'll send you to 10 others that are sudden, and you'll find yourself in a rabbit hole. And you could watch a, a video that's incredibly uh, bigoted or uh, you know all kinds of other things. And it'll suggest, how oh, do you like that? Have 20 more. And it drives people away from good information and puts them in a, in a hole where you know it's easy to lose your perspective and your bearings and we need to get this country back to having perspective and bearings this can't continue we are a tilt and so i believe you know it, it's not it won't be an individual but it will be a reset somebody is going to change the paradigm and create a model that is entertain but effective that doesn't look at things from the right and the left but looks at things the difference between clarity and noise the difference between corruption and integrity dishonesty and honesty those are the axes by which we should be pursuing our information uh and and until we start doing that i think we're going to find ourselves further and further down this rabbit hole uh so I have hope, again, we talked about the younger generation. I, I have hope that people are going to start seeing it for what it is and rejecting it. And that, and, and mainstreaming a different, better model that, that isn't so corrosive. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank awesome. you. Hey, let's, uh, John, uh, John, are we good on time on your end? We have yeah. a few questions. Are we good? Okay. Are we good on time? Oh, wait, hold on a second. My, my kids know. are staring at me. That's my son, Nate. <laughs> my daughter, Maggie. All right. He's, he's eating a yogurt. Oh boy, what did I do? He's eating a yogurt, and you're, that's sweet potato bag. Yeah, that's. 
Uh, I don't know if you throw them all out, but certainly that one. The sweet potato is <laughs> not supposed to wink at you, right? <laughs> that's yeah. that's not healthy. You could you throw should throw that out. out. We'll no. All right, so all right. <laughs> so we're good on a few more questions. Tim, go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Just unmuting it. How's it going again, John? Hey, what's up? Um, I had a I had a question. So um, you mentioned not looking at uh, you know the the military as as like kind of uh, blocking you from your future goal. I'm I have I have eight years left in the military, uh, and then mm -hmm. I'm moving to New York. So I'm 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 gonna be there starting late. Do you have any advice for for me getting there, I feel like I'm kind of behind the curve just because I'm going to be older than a lot of the, the new class coming in, you know? Um, so again, embrace what's unique about your experience. You're not behind anything. You're living a life that almost no one else in that field is going to have led, which means you're going to be able to mine an incredibly rich vein of experience that is uniquely yours. You know, as a stand-up comic, the best thing you can be is authentically you. And you'll create jokes and stories and humor that could only come from you. That's what being a good comic is, is when you start to learn how to create things that can only come from you. And what's so great about what you're doing is you're creating this rich tapestry of experience. You're going to be going up against a bunch of knuckleheads. You move there at you know, 21 from college and they're going to be talking about, my girlfriend said this and my mother said that. Well, you, right. you, you've got this whole vein of mm -hmm. other things that you can talk about and you can mine for content. So I would say don't, look at any of this as a disadvantage look at it for what it really is which is an enormous advantage and one that sets you apart from all the other knuckleheads that are out there you know banging it out day in and, and day out in the clubs you've mm -hmm. lived a life you know what i mean so i'm um, embrace it awesome thanks john i really appreciate that and thanks again for everything thanks. Morales. Luck out there. Have fun with it. Thanks, man. I appreciate it. No worries. Morales, go ahead. Floor is yours, brother. Aloha again, John. Um, all right. So, Aloha. so uh, I guess my question is, is from the start of the spark of the authentic idea and life mm -hmm. or, or life experience, what is the right. process from going from there to the stage? What is your process in particular? You know, it's funny. You would think that a creative process is very disordered. That, you know, you wake up in the middle of the night with an inspiration and you sit and you dream and you think. But for me, and I learned this from George Carlin, who was one of my heroes and someone that I was fortunate enough to uh, become friendly with. It's work, man. Put in your time. You know, he would get up every day and he would sit down and he would order his thoughts and he would write things down. And you'll find, like, think of yourself as a refinery. Think of, think of art as a refinery. You know, you're putting materials in and you're whittling it down to get a product that's a little bit more sophisticated. It's like, you know, like, like anything where the raw materials put through a process become something more sophisticated and more interesting the further you go along but use the same process that you've used to advance uh, other skills in your life to your art to the things that you want to create you know create a uh, I actually work well off of outlines so what I'll do is I'll I'll just take a bunch of those uh, postcards and I'll write my whether I'm doing a story or an act and I'll just organize it and then I'll, I'll stir with it. You know what I mean? I'll sit with it and then it's just trial and error. And you know what it is? It's funny. A lot of it's like what I would imagine a musician is you put things out there and you try to get a feel for the rhythm of it. 
and for like what notes feel true and what feels discordant, what sound, what doesn't sound right. Like if you're writing a song and you hear a note and you go, meh, that doesn't sound right. That doesn't feel right. Trust it. Trust your instincts, develop that internal barometer, but also trust your discomfort. If you've got an idea and it's blood from a stone, chances are it's not the right idea. But the beautiful thing about ideas is you, you got a million of them. Don't be too precious with it. If it's not working, put it on the, put it on the side burner. Let it sit, let it, let it percolate over there. Put your attention into another area. You know, it's, I, I'm really a believer that, that good process makes good product. And, and it's as important to work on your process as it is to kind of work on your product, if that, if that makes sense. It does. It does. Very well, thank you for that advice. And, and you mentioned George Carlin, um, former airman, just like uh, me and Lewis. Yeah. Over and and there you go. And, and Dio. Outstanding. Hey, so here we go. Switch gears. Last final questions. I got one from the field. Yep. I find this kind of funny. Yamil Flores asks, question for John. If you had to pick your VP, vice president, and the choices were Colbert, Trevor, Steve Carell, or John Oliver, who would it be? <laughs> wow. Putting you on the spot, Colbert. Yamil. You're putting them on the spot, Yamil. <laughs> Colbert can cook. So as a running mate, you know, listen, they're all incredibly intelligent, incredibly uh, warm and witty people, but a guy's got to eat. And I know Colbert can, you know, with very few ingredients, he can whip something up pretty good. I know that's not necessarily the thing you look for in a vice president first, but it doesn't hurt. Man gets, man gets hungry out there in the campaign trail. <laughs> He does a nice, he does a nice, uh, like a, like a cowboy, uh, caviar, he calls it. It's like a black eyed peas and tomatoes and a little bit of avocado. A little bit of so there you heard it. John and and Oliver, is, Oliver is British. So, you know, they eat like crap. So I'm not taking <laughs> that. So I'm going to go with, you know, left to his own devices. He would just boil something. <laughs> Have, have some respect for your taste buds, for God's sakes. So uh, I'm going to go with Colbert. He knows how to season things. He can whip it up. Looks good in an apron. Yeah. That's <laughs> yeah. Outstanding. So, so John, uh, please let us know. Let the audience know what's ahead for you and what projects are you working on that you could tell us about? Uh, just working on some stand up and things like that. Like everybody else, I'm kind of in a weird holding pattern. Um, you know, there's no production going on right now. There's no real shows. Uh, Dave Chappelle and I, uh, Dave's doing some stuff out in Ohio. So I went out there and, and joined him for a little bit, but for the most part, just trying to hang in there. Um, keep everybody safe and healthy. Um, you know, make sure everybody's just staying as sane as they can and uh and laying some groundwork for some other things the one thing i will say is i think in september we're going to try and roll out this new uh presumptive bill about not just burn pits but toxic exposures in general so we welcome any and all support uh we're going to try and roll it out uh with a little press conference down in dc in september socially distanced but uh you know, we're hoping that we can gain. It's a tough time. I know everybody's thinking about other things, but these individuals uh, are even more vulnerable during a time of uh, a respiratory illness, you know, than they are normally. So we, we don't want to just let it wait, let it languish. You know, every, every, every moment that we wait, you know, pe people get sick. So, uh, so that's what we're going to be rolling out in September. So hopefully you guys see that get a chance to support it. So John, where is the best place for viewers to go online to keep up with you? Can we find you on social media or what do you suggest? I'm not on social media because I'm an old man. <laughs> um, so I don't, I, you know, 
I don't know how people keep up with me. Generally, people aren't that interested in keeping up with me. Um, but you uh, have a good uh, like. I I googled you and could find stuff, but I didn't know. And there you go. I, I could not find you on social media, so I'm so glad that you said that you're not on there because I'm like, what am I doing wrong? I cannot yeah. find him on Twitter or anything. So. There was one guy on Instagram. It said John Stewart, like 19. I was like, oh look, maybe that's him. And had like your face, and I was like. No, nah, I wasn't. Not him. him. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. No, I've never done that. You know, uh, I've never been on it. I, you know, I think it's it's like certain things that come by just are so they don't make enough sense to you. I, I, I I'm a sort of a reclusive kind of an individual to begin with, uh, and social media always felt like I think for a performer, social media you feel like oh, there's an audience out there all the time. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So I think I would always feel like, should I be telling a joke right now? <laughs> like, I, I think just always be ever present in my mind. And I don't, I, I think I would be uncomfortable. Like too, too much discomfort for me. Um, and on a day-to-day -day basis, my thoughts are just not that interesting. You know, I mean, for God's sakes, I just did five minutes on the fact that Colbert knows how to make a dip. I mean, for goodness <laughs> sakes, you know, can you imagine that's my Facebook feed? People would be like, this, I, this is a crazy person. I don't need this. So uh, I, I think you're all better off having me collect my thoughts before I say something than just blah, blah off the top of my head. It, it wouldn't be pretty. Well, well, John, hey, stick around real quick. I'm going to close this out, but don't hang up. Um, it's truly been an honor having you with us today. We appreciate you spending time. My with pleasure. Your family. And of course, you know, helping boost morale for all the troops out there watching. Uh, this means so much to our airmen, soldiers, sailors, Marines, Coasties, and family members. We wish you all the best. Exchange out. Thank you so much. And I wish you guys all the best and stay safe and healthy. And we'll see you guys soon. You got it. Thanks. Bye, y'all. Bye. Don't John. hang up, though, John. Don't hang up. Okay. Stopping this. I stream. won't. Mm -hmm.